Okay, so thank you for, for joining me at this point in the day when I know everybody is slightly frazzled from multiple different sessions, both upstairs and in here. Um, this session is going to be about uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, and it's going to be specifically about learning and the implementation of learning on AWS. So I'm going to take you through three different things. I'm going to take you through an initial look at what is AWS, what do we mean when we're talking about AWS, I'm then going to talk a little bit about some of the services that can be used for rollout of traditional um, learning, both e-learning and uh, tutor-based learning, trainer-based learning um, with AWS. And then I'm going to wrap up with some of the less conventional stuff that there are opportunities to do um, from, from AWS as well. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of background on me, oh, my slide is slightly out of alignment, but never mind. Um, my name is Matt Wicks. I'm the CTO of the Dream Tech Group. The Dream Tech Group is a, is a collection of companies that do various things. We do things from video production through to software development, uh, learning management system, portal implementation, mobile app development, and virtual reality. We're based in the UK, in Lisbon, in Portugal, in Dubai, in New York, um, and in San Francisco. Um, I'm also a certified Amazon architect, which means that I make houses out of books. Um, no, what it actually means is that um, I'm able to talk about some of these things, um, and, and particularly in relation to learning. My background before I did all of this stuff, I was uh, a technical trainer for, uh, for 12 years. So I've got a kind of odd, eclectic mixture of, of skills here. So AWS, Amazon Web Services. Um, let's just have a quick sort of high-level view of what it is and where it's at. Um, I think in this day and age, most people have heard of Amazon, the bookseller, and, and many, many people have heard of Amazon, the supermarket now, and now we have Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services has been going for a long, long time, and it is a collection of different services, as, as uh, the name implies. But at its core, what you should think about it as is a whole group of different computers, different data centers in different places around the world. Now what we're going to be talking about in this session is about all the stuff they've put on top of that. All the things you can do with those computers and all the services that they offer in relation uh, and how they relate to learning. But in particular here, just to make you aware of the broad reach of it, you can see here um, where each of, these, uh, each of the regions are and how broadly spread they are around the world. And that's very important because one of the key things about having content delivered through Amazon, having services delivered through Amazon, is it's all about speed. It's all about speed of delivery, quality of delivery, the ability to localize very, very simply, and to leverage services in not just the closest region, but sometimes the most cost-effective region. Because that's another key tenet of what we're talking about here. Sometimes it's actually a lot cheaper to run your system in Singapore than it is to run it in London. Sometimes it's going to be cheaper to run a, run a service in Sao Paulo than it is to run it in London. And with, by using AWS, you're able to make the most of that and therefore minimize your investment. But equally, you're able to, um, to maximize the, uh, oh sorry, to minimize the, the latency, the time that it takes for people to get your content, as we we'll see. So you can see here, these numbers in these, um, in these yellow circles refer to the number of what are called availability zones. I don't want to go too deeply into, into this at the moment, but in order to make sure that all of your data is, is secure and protected, um, you can basically store it in a region, which might, be, uh, which might be here, for example, in Ireland, but within that you have three different availability zones, three different groups of, of data centers uh, that are put together to spread things. And you can see the bluish, greenish ones are the data centers, sorry, are the, are the regions that are coming soon. So Amazon is very, very aggressively expanding in the market. They're the market leaders, um, and, and the market leaders in a number of different ways. Firstly, in terms of scale, but also, and I think this is where learning is what's most important for learning, in terms of innovation, and in terms of um, ease of delivery as well. So let me dig into that a little bit more. I'm not going to go through all of these. We'd be here a week. But when you log in to an Amazon control panel, this is what you see. This is all of the different services that are available. Okay? Now some of these, I would say about 60 or 70% of these are very relevant to people who are trying to deploy different levels of learning. Now it might be that what you're trying to deploy is some content and you just want that content to be easily accessible. It might be that what you want to do is deploy a learning management system. It might be that what you want to do is deploy a mobile app 
It might be that what you want to do is have a live video cast, and sometimes in your video cast, you're going to have 200 people, and sometimes you're going to have 200,000 people. Um, all of those scenarios can be catered for here. But there are, additional, um, there are additional things that can be catered for. For example, what about if you're doing some training on an engineering system? And that engineering system, you want to have a shared experience between people who are in Dubai and people who are in New York. Amazon can help you do that and can help you get the metrics and crunch the metrics. What about if you want to run a system or, or an event and during the course of that event, you want to understand on a very granular level how people are reacting in social media to that. Amazon can provide the facilities for you to be able to do all of that. What about if you want to go the whole hog and as part of your learning, you want to develop a 3D immersive environment that is, that is um, a, 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 a virtual car, a virtual world that you can walk around. But you've got to try to deliver that to clunky old computers. Can you do that? Actually, yes, you can. You can do that through various Amazon things that I'll show you. So let me um, just give two more slides about what Amazon is before we get into the depth of it. There are thousands and thousands of companies that use Amazon for various different things. This web page gives a whole list of uh, various case studies. There are about 250 of them, uh, and they range from large banks being purely online through to small companies investing in their training resources online. Sometimes they're people who have moved totally online. Sometimes they're people who have got a mixture of keeping stuff in their own data centers, in their own systems, and then delivering content through Amazon as well. Each of these is a possible option. These are just a few that I picked out um, largely at random. The one that I want to highlight, though, is Netflix. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of the support that you get through AWS and the scale of the facilities that they have. Um, so Netflix delivers all its content through, almost all its content through Amazon. This is an example which I think is 329 billion, 400 million um, gigabytes of data that they sent last year. That's 425 billion streaming hours, or a lot of TV, basically. So that's an enormous amount of data. So therefore, what that tells us in terms of us wanting to deliver our content is there's a lot of optimization that's been put into the system, obviously for Netflix, but also at the AWS level as well. But also, there's a very robust and secure infrastructure that is in there as well. So let's look at some specific examples. Okay? This is the most technical screen, so don't worry if you're not technical. One of the most obvious scenarios is I have an LMS. I want to deploy an LMS, a learning management system. And I want to deploy that, and I want to move it from, from our infrastructure, or we don't have some infrastructure. I want to deploy an LMS for the first time. And I want to do this in a way that's reliable and possibly scalable as well. But most importantly, I want to do it in a way where I can control the costs. Amazon allows you to do that. It has, um, it has the ability to create what are called auto-scaling groups. And what that means is I have one computer here, and on that computer I put my software. And I can, I can then set it up so that if this, system, if this computer goes down, a copy of that one automatically comes up. So there's no downtime um, in there uh, either. But what's also more important than that is I want to be able to grow. So how can I grow? When I set up my one computer with my learning management system on, I'm dealing with 2,000 users. There's an acquisition, another acquisition. My company's doing really well. We've just bought 16 companies. Suddenly, we've got 90,000, 100,000 users. Does that mean I've got to reinvent the whole infrastructure? Well, not in this case. Obviously, there are, <laughs> there are, there are bigger considerations when you scale up that much anyway. But in terms of what you can do here, you can simply add more copies of the same machine into your system, and that will scale out. And that's a really core, core piece of, of the difference between being able to, to do it within the cloud, within Amazon, and doing it in your own system. Um, why is that? Because if you were to do this in a traditional model, you would have your learning management system on one server, and then you buy another server, another server, another server. And of course, you're always working to peak capacity. What happens if there are 80,000 users online at one time? How do I deal with that? I deal with that by buying thousands of servers, which cost me thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds sitting there. But via Amazon, I only need to keep on the ones that are being used at any time. So for example, if you're all working inside, uh, inside the same uh, continent, you're going to have peaks and troughs. And at that point, you can shut machines down, and you only pay for those machines in the time that they're actually being used. 
So you can make things much more cost effective in that way. But also, as I say, the key thing is that it gives you the capacity to grow and it does it in a very cost effective way. Taking this further though, um, takes us into a couple of other services which are really important. If you've got a learning management system, that's basically running there as your core learning database. But what you're really interested in is delivering your content to the end users. You're interested in delivering your e-learning, and I'm talking e-learning here for the moment. I'll talk about trainer-led learning in a moment as well. You're interested in delivering your e-learning to people, and maybe those people are all in London, but the chances are nowadays they're not. They're probably going to be in New York, they're going to be in Sydney, they're going to be in Dubai, they're going to be in Johannesburg, they're going to be in Sao Paulo, they're going to be all around the world. How can you do that effectively? Well, um, the way in which Amazon does that is through a number of different services, all of which combine. Um, the main one that they use for that is CloudFront, which is a content distribution network. So you can very easily use something which, which they call an S3 bucket. Um, and all an S3 bucket is, is a folder. And what you do is you upload your content into this S3 bucket. And that S3 bucket contains your, your content, organized as you would organize it or as your learning management system organizes it. it. But by using CloudFront, that means that your content is then distributed around the world. So for example, if I'm sitting inside, um, if I'm sitting inside Dubai and I've loaded my content into the Amazon cloud. The first time, the first time that I, somebody, uh, the first time that somebody comes to view that content, it's going to be taken and it's going to be cached locally within the Amazon cloud structure, um, as close as possible to Dubai. And that means that the next person who comes to view this content isn't going to come all the way back to my original place and get the content from there, but it's going to be served from from the CloudFront. Um, from the CloudFront content distribution network. Now that gives you a lot of benefits because it allows you to very, very quickly distribute content. It also gives you some other benefits which are, which are incremental here. S3 allows you to keep different versions of your content very, very easily. So you can just go back to an older version if you want to. It also has another service underneath it which is something called Glacier which allows you to preserve information um, for a very, very long time at a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the costs. So it costs um, something like $0.001 uh, dollar per gigabyte that you're storing inside Glacier. And, what, and that's very useful if you've got training records or you've got training materials that you want to archive for a very, very long period of time, but you don't necessarily want to use on an ongoing basis. And that's a huge benefit if you have this huge repository of old materials that you think one, may, one day you may need to use or potentially for auditing purposes you need to maintain and persist. That's also very useful there. So most of your content would sit in S3. Behind that you've got Glacier for long-term archiving and you've got CloudFront to distribute your content. And as you saw at the beginning from the map that I put on um, right at the beginning, there are all of these different places where your content can be distributed to. But that's not all. It goes a lot further than that. This is a list of what are called edge locations. So all of those locations that I told, showed you in the map at the beginning are the main, the core Amazon services. But in order to make sure that you're getting as close as possible to the point of distribution for your content, there are also edge locations, which are, think of them as smaller locations where your content can be, just, can be sent out. And the numbers, so there are three in Germany, two in Singapore, three in, South, in Korea, for example. So for example, I can go into, uh, I can load up my content in England and it can be distributed to either Rio or Sao Paulo in Brazil, whichever is nearest to me, to reduce down that latency and to reduce down the weight. The other thing to say about CloudFront is that there are various different levels of security you can apply to this. So you can, apply, you can have it open for anybody to use. Um, to, to view the content. You can have it so that it's restricted based on region. So you can say anybody in this region can't view this content. You can have it restricted so that when you create, when you want to view the content, your IP address, your computer's address is used to create a unique um, URL, a unique web address for that piece of content. And that is specific to you. So if, for example, I'm working with sensitive material, I log on, and I get taken to this video, and that video is, is at a unique, a unique URL for me. So if I want to copy it, I want to copy it and I want to send it to a friend of mine who shouldn't really see it, I can't just copy the, 
uh, the URL and put it in there. That URL won't work for them. You can also have time expiring URLs for there as well. You can, you know, there, there are lots of different ways to secure um, this content in there as well. Okay. Okay. So part of this as well is relate, relate, related to something called Route 53. Now, it would get very, very kind of too deep for, for this 20-minute conversation to go into what that is. But essentially, what it allows me to do is to have all around the world, I can set up my LMS in five or six or seven of those different regions. I can have a copy of each of those different regions. And what I can do is I can set up my, the, the, the domain name, the web address that I use to get those so that it's smart enough to detect that you're in Russia, you're in Italy, you're in Germany, you're in Dubai, and it will send you to the server that's closest to you. Again, reducing the time for delivery, but not just reducing the time for delivery, allowing me to very clearly target content based on where somebody's accessing it from as well, which is a very interesting concept as well, because it means that instead of having to keep your content in multiple different, if it's region-specific content, in various different regions, you can actually make use of that to target content to specific users in specific regions, and if you want to, to block users from specific areas and specific countries or regions as well. Okay. All of that's manageable, and all of it's part of the same thing. It's all about, exactly as with the CloudFront distribution, exactly as with having all these different regions and using you know, separate um, networks to get to it, this Route 53 latency-based routing, blah, 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 is basically another way of delivering content as rapidly and as targeted as possible to your end user. So you're not incurring additional costs, they're not incurring additional costs. Okay. Scaling for the big days. This is another really, really important concept. And this is something that I think is increasingly important in terms of learning delivery and in terms of different patterns of learning delivery. So when we talked about CloudFront, I talked about uploading files and being able to distribute all of those files. It's not just files. So all of the edge locations within Amazon Web Services are also based on Adobe Media Encoder. So what that means is that you are then able to um, to present live video via, via CloudFront and via, well, via various different ways. But live video, it's smart enough to turn it into different, different um, delivery mechanisms, such as uh, you can have old-fashioned RTMP, you can have HLS, HDS, different, different video distribution mechanisms. All of this is done, again, at your edge locations. So it's pushing the information out as close as possible to the people who are there. So I can stand up as a trainer. We could do this session live, and it could be broadcast via the content distribution network with two or three clicks of a button out to anybody who is subscribed to this, to this thing. But more than that, what have we got here? 20 people, 25 people. Maybe in my global audience today, I've got 100 people. But maybe suddenly tomorrow, I'm going to launch my new device, which is going to be the, uh, the new phone that is going to overtake Apple or something, something massive and it's generated a lot of interest, or it's just something that I want every single member of the company to be part of. And in my company, there are 12, 13,000 people involved in there. Same thing here, it scales, everything scales. So if you're just doing live video, it will allow you to scale up to accommodate large and large and larger numbers of people. And it will also gather metrics the whole time. Underneath this is a very clever, very sensitive monitoring system that gives you lots of information, but also gives your IT department lots of reassurance about the fact that if something goes wrong, they're going to hear about it very, very quickly. So that's part of it. You can bring in the crowds to the classroom in the sky because you can basically scale up as big or as small as you want it to be. And remember, you only pay for what you consume. So it's not like you're sitting there with 700 servers waiting for that one big day a year. You're sitting there with one server until the day you need 700 for a couple of hours, and then you've got those there. And it scales up. So you can deliver your content to as many people, and you can deliver your live broadcast to as many people as you want to as well. Getting a bit further along this, we get into the next level of, of things. You know, thinking and moving beyond the standard of, of LMS, content distribution, live broadcast, what can you do now that makes use of this even further? How far can you take this? Well, I alluded to this at the beginning, the ultimate social learning and analysis. Social learning is all about sharing. Social learning is all about teams and groups of self-organizing people delivering content and finding content for each other as they want. You know, and we're taking this further because there are a, a large number of services within Amazon which allow you to, to analyze 
large amounts of data over short or long periods in real time. And this might be data that's coming in from social networks. It might be data that's coming in from, from the news. It might be data that's analyzed and brought out of live video feeds. You know, there are loads and loads of different ways in which this can be. And obviously, there's a certain amount of scale that is required to be able to do this. But typically, this is used, for example, during product launches. They use it to, you, to, to understand real-time sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is where, basically, a, a bunch of computers in the sky, in, in the cloud, will grab all of the tweets, all of the Facebook references, all of the Google Plus references, which are fewer in number, and all of the various different things, which will then, then all references in the media, it will then analyze the language around those and will give you a feeling of whether this is a positive or a negative. How are people reacting to something? So during an Apple broadcast, for example, how are people reacting to all the various different releases? During a Samsung broadcast, how are people reacting to all of the various different things on social networks? Why is this useful for learning? Well, I think it's very useful, even if you're not doing it as live, to be able to perform sentiment analysis on various different instances of things that have been done. You know, responses, obviously not to small scale courses, but to large scale courses are very useful. But also, that large scale, that large scale analysis of how people are, uh, are working and how data is being tracked during, a, uh, during a, either a shared learning experience such as an event or over a period of time, Amazon provides lots of tools that are built in situ for that sort of data analysis as well, um, as well as um, a smaller analysis too. Also, delivering and testing mobile learning. So, so there are a whole bunch of tools, many, many excellent tools here, um, which are all about developing mobile content and are all about being able to distribute mobile content. And you know, as, as I've heard said a couple of times, mobile learning is, is a, it's almost a term you don't need to worry about in terms of developing the learning. Of course, learning should be mobile. But what I'm talking about here is something that's slightly different, which is you've got your learning, you've got your apps, you've got your content, you've got your responsive content and all of those things. What, what else can we add to it to make it better? Well, there are a number of things. First of all, we have um, AWS Device Farm. What AWS Device Farm is, is a solution so that you don't have to buy 20,000 different devices. It's a, it's a way of you being able to test through Amazon all of your e-learning or some of your e-learning on different devices. And these are not emulators or simulators. These are real devices that you're able to log into remotely to see and see how your e-learning works. So that's one thing. You also have AWS Cognito. This is very important um, in terms of being able to distribute content. Obviously, from the point of view of understanding learning, you want to understand who is on your system at any given time. You have your LMS for that in one way. But you also have Cognito. Cognito manages your identity. So it allows you to log in through various different systems, you know, through third-party systems, through its own system, and it will then allow you to have highly advanced, in-depth tracking of metrics within your mobile application or mobile site. So that's actually quite an interesting um, thing as well. And it can integrate with other third-party providers as well. And then finally, it provides a suite of mobile analytics. And these mobile analytics can also be, and I should say this, this is not just the mobile analytics. All of the analytics that are provided within um, AWS are able to be customized to provide you with a lot more detail on the specifics you're looking for. But here, for example, you can see there is a, this is a very, very simple page, but you can see you've got an overview of the number of users on your system, on your mobile app, the daily number of active users, the monthly active users, the sticky factor, how many are retained from day one. And then you can break down there, you'll see those tabs at the top. You can break down there and see a lot more detail about those as well. Those metrics can, of course, be exported. They can be used in any other data crunching analysis tool that you've got. They can be linked to other analysis as well. So there are a massive number of things that you can do here. And all of this is, is built in. And one of the things that I particularly like, and you'll see this throughout the whole of, of AWS, is um, the lifetime value per user, which is identifying the commercial costs, sorry, the commercial result, the return on investment of your application um, that you've built and developed. Okay, so that's another one that's in there um, and is all part of the AWS ecostructure. But it's just the beginning. Okay, there are a whole bunch of other things that are within the Amazon services that as people are beginning to develop more and more sophisticated learning environments. So, so we see people developing real-time simulations, 3D simulations. We see people developing um, VR worlds. We see people doing 3D 
um, 3D recordings as well. Um, as, as this is being 3D recorded, I can't quite imagine what they're going to have here, but you'll see. Um, so you'll see here, this is just the beginning. Um, I want to pick out three features that I think are very interesting. So I mentioned at the beginning AppStream. AppStream is a very, very, very interesting um, innovation. AppStream is designed to allow you to take high performance uh, applications. So this might be your walkthrough. Um, let's say, for example, I've got to do a health and safety check. And part of that is a walkthrough, a 3D environment to spot the issues that there are there. It might be something much simpler. It might just be that I've created a 3D environment of my phone that I want to be able to rotate it around and look at it or something like that as a learning thing. The problem I have is I've spent millions on developing this fantastic thing, and then the client I want to deploy it to tells me that they're all on really old computers and low-performing computers, and, and this is a huge issue. AppStream is designed to overcome that issue because it streams your app, like you stream video, like Netflix or Amazon Prime stream video to your, 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 your TV, um, and the only barrier is your bandwidth. You know, it's the same with AppStream. It will stream the application to your, um, to your older computer, as well as your newer computer, as well as your devices, and so on. Because it's all about this infrastructure that I've talked about, where everything is all about lowering the latency, speeding the delivery, making things smoother, getting it to you quicker. And now they've been able to take that and apply that to um, to AppStream. So if you've got simulations that you want to put in there, that's the sort of thing you can do. You want to take it even further, the ability to create those simulations, to create those walkthroughs, to create those games is done through something. You can do this now in Amazon through something called Lumberyard, which is essentially a tool for, for building games. It's not quite that, but essentially that's a, that's a snappy uh, summary of it. Lumberyard is a tool for building games. And then you can distribute that using GameLift, and what GameLift allows you to do is to take those interactions, to take those games, multiplayer, multi-user events, so you can very easily have a virtual conference, for example. You could very easily have a virtual environment where people are trying to work together in different environments to solve a single problem as part of your learning. And it's been relatively easy to do because I've used Lumberyard. Lumberyard. I don't need a whole lot of background information on how to build games. GameLift will scale and, and decrease according to the scale and number of people you have on at any one time. Um, and so that, again, it's the same thing. It's just taking it through to the next generation. The final thing I want to talk about is something called AWS IoT. They love the acronyms. AWS Internet of Things. So what this is, most people have heard of the Internet of Things. It's where all devices are going to be connected. Obviously, as we develop learning for real-world devices, we want to be able to track how people are doing that and how people are being able to integrate with that. So let's say, for example, our 3D camera here. Let's say, for example, that we have been able to connect this to AWS IoT, AWS um, uh, Internet of Things. This will constantly be sending information back into the system. So if let's take a simple example. Let's say I'm trying to teach you how to um, repair a bunch of temperature sensors and I've got a team of 1,000 engineers in multiple different um, countries that I want to be able to, to do this with. Because my temperature sensors are connected to this all the time, I, when, when my, when my um, employees, when my delegates are given training tasks using my temperature sensors or whatever piece of equipment it is, the way in which they're working with it and the changes that they make to the temperature sensor and the effect of that will be fed back as data into my AWS IoT area, so I will have a massive amount of data constantly being pumped in. So when my CEO comes to me and says to me, hey Matt, how did that piece of training on those, on those temperature sensors go? I can say, well, 45% of people managed to get the two degree calibration, but 75% of people failed to, or something like that. And he'll say, what? But you know, that's a start. Um, so this is, this is a really interesting and exciting way of linking up the real world with all of this stuff. So it's all about delivery, it's all about scale, it's all about managing your costs, it's all about not putting the E on the next learn, like design, um, and it's all, about, it's all about being able to move with the times but without changing the underlying infrastructure that you've got in there as well. Okay, so um, I'm very happy to answer any questions anybody has immediately following this. I'm Matt Wicks, uh, I'm on Twitter at The Virtual Forge, um, and you can just about see that, matt.wicks at thevirtualforge.com. If you have any questions you'd like to take up with me, that's absolutely fine. Otherwise, we're over on stand 
34, thank you. We're over on stand 34, uh, or Georgia will also be there to answer any questions about the video production slide. Um, you know, and as I say, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you've got. Thank you all for your time this late in the afternoon. Much appreciated.